Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Hello and good morning, and you're welcome to today's Signpost webinar. We hope you're keeping safe and well wherever you're joining us from today. Today, we'll be discussing water quality in the context of Ireland's Nitrates Action Programme and what does it mean for the wider agri-food sector. Now, we do know that nitrogen is a crucial nutrient that helps plants and crops grow, but high concentrations are harmful uh, to people and nature. And excess nitrogen from agricultural sources is one of the main causes of water pollution in Europe. So the purpose of the Nitrates Action Programme is to prevent pollution of surface waters and groundwater from agricultural sources and to protect and improve water quality. And we're delighted to be joined by two important people who have responsibility for implementation of aspects of Ireland's Nitrates Action Programme. Ted Massey and Finbar O'Regan are agricultural inspectors with the Department of Agriculture, Food and the Marine. Ted and Finbar, you're very welcome to this morning's webinar. Good morning to you both. And to Pat, Murphy, good morning to you. You're going morning. to help us out with questions afterwards. Um, so we're going to have two presentations from Finbar and Ted this morning. Uh, Finbar, maybe you could tell us a little bit about yourself and the work that you're doing in the department. Uh, yeah, Mark. So I suppose I spent years in working in pesticides and I've now moved into the fertilizers, um, feed, grain and poultry division uh, with responsibility for fertilizers. So one of the things we're working on is the National Fertilizer Database. Uh, there's also new EU legislation on fertilizers and we'll be working on our own legislation as well. So that should keep me busy uh, for a while. <laughs> Brilliant. And you're going to share some slides with us about, about that in, uh, shortly. Yeah. And uh, Ted, uh, could you tell us about the work that you're doing? Yeah, I am head of nitrates and biodiversity division within the Department of Agriculture. So in terms of in terms of nitrates or, or water quality, I'm responsible uh, working in conjunction with my colleagues in the Department of Housing. Um, for development of Ireland's Nitrates Action Programme. And then we're also responsible for, for enforcement or implementation as well within DAFM. Okay, so you've got quite a broad brief there by the sounds of it. Um, great. Well, look, we're, we look forward to talking to you afterwards, Ted, and you're going to give us a presentation also. Finbar, we'll hand over to you. So I'm going to speak about the National Fertiliser Database. Um, <clears throat> this is something that's coming in. There's legislation uh, going through the Oireachtas at the moment uh, to allow us to do this. Uh, so the overview, I'm just looking at the aim, uh, why we need a national fertilizer database, uh, the legislation that's being worked on for it, uh, the uh, requirements, uh, both for fertilizer end users, which in the main will be farmers, and also for any retailers of fertilizer merchants, co-ops, and so on. And I'll speak briefly about the IT system um, and how it's, uh, how it's used by both sets of, uh, of players. So aims of National Fertilizer Database. So we want to provide accurate tracking of sales of fertilizer through the whole supply chain. So from import to end user. Um, achieve, this will enable us to achieve better compliance with water quality and environmental ambitions. Sorry, uh, provide data for monitoring climate targets uh, is another important aspect of this as there are commitments uh, under uh, climate action programs uh, and fulfills a commitment to the European Commission and will be the key to securing any future nitrates derogation. I suppose the Commission have looked for this sort of system uh, from, uh, for, from member states uh, who want to continue with the derogation. Uh, in time, it should simplify and provide reliable data for, to farmers for um, private sustainability schemes uh, with co-ops um, and other businesses and also department schemes, uh, eco schemes, nitrates and liming. So the legislation, it's an amendment to um, the 1955 Fertilizer Act. Uh, it's been through the pre-legislative scrutiny and the bill is due to commence second stage examination in the Oireachtas. Uh, so that's the stage it's at at the moment. And there is a link uh, if you want to have a look at the bill. Uh, it's combined with medicated feed um, as well, the veterinary medicine products and medicated feed. Uh, that, that allowed us to get it through the system much more quickly than we would, uh, would have otherwise, as that was quite advanced when we joined. So key, key requirements of the legislation, uh, registration with the Department of Fertilizer Economic Operators. These are anyone who's um, selling, really selling the um, fertilizers, merchants, co-ops, and so on. Uh, 
we focus on, I suppose, merchants, co-ops and uh, fertilizer end users, uh, farmers in the main. Uh, so they all have to register once the legislation is enacted. Um, selling fertilizer, you need to be registered if you're selling fertilizer and you need to be registered to buy fertilizer. Now, there is a an exception in terms of domestic use, those small kind of garden products, um, and that's dealt with in the legislation as well. Uh, registration for farmers is a very straightforward process on ag food. Um, and there is actually, I'll come to it later, but there are videos that our IT section have put up online uh, to talk through uh, what's involved with that on the on the system. Uh, so it is just a few clicks uh, to accept and you, you will be uh, registered. Uh, once you're registered, a unique identifier will be assigned uh, in that system. For farmers, that will be the herd number. Uh, fertilizer purchased by farmers from FVOs, it's the obligation of the merchant or the co-op to report that data to the department. So the co-ops and merchants will be uploading that information. Farmers don't have to do that. Uh, reporting for, for farmers, uh, the requirements are to report on farm stock once a year. Uh, the date for that is yet to be decided, but it'll probably be in the autumn. Uh, farm to farm sales or movements. So if there's movement between one farmer and, and another of fertilizer, we need to know that. And I suppose it's the physical movement of fertilizer and where fertilizer is present uh, that we're interested in. And then direct imports of fertilizer onto, directly onto farm from um, another another country. Uh, Northern Ireland in the main would be the obvious one there, but there's other imports that go on directly onto farm from possibly the UK and other European countries. So that can be recorded on the system as well. So what information is required? And this is more for, again, this is for the merchants and co-ops. Uh, so who's it from? So the merchant and co-op unique identifier number will go in there. Uh, the product ID. So we have a product catalog set up at the moment um, and there'll be a number attached to that. Uh, this will be a drop down a drop down list for um, for the merchants uh, and co-ops, uh, but there's also an option of incorporating that into their own systems um, and uploading it that way. Uh, who it's um, sold to, so that would be a herd number for the most part. Uh, the quantity of fertilizer in tons, uh, the date, and the date I suppose is the date of dispatch. It's not the date that um, a product is bought. It's when it actually physically leaves the the merchant's yard. Uh, and arrives in the farmer's yard. And then the transaction type, uh, which can be sale or return. So if there's a problem with fertilizer, um, there is a facility to return that so that that's not counted um, in the farmer's numbers at the end of the year. And then there's original transaction ID. Uh, this is something that was looked for by um, co-ops. It's just, it may be easier for them to track with their own tracking number uh, within the system if there is an issue. So methods of transmitting this data uh, to the department. So one way is manual entry on ag food. Um, this is fine if you're very small, uh, but for medium to large um, businesses, it's probably not feasible. Um, and we would encourage use of the API. <clears throat> the API, an application programming interface. Uh, I'm not an IT expert, but essentially what it allows you to do is for your system to talk to our system and upload data automatically. Uh, so you're no longer entering this stuff manually. So the API is available for testing. Uh, so that's details of it there. Um, so if you um, email that email address, um, our IT people will get back to you with all the details of how to go about getting set up and testing that system. And we would encourage people uh, to do that because it'll make life easier when the system goes live uh, to know that you are in a position where it will work for you quite quickly. Um, this is just what it looks like in ag food for a, an FEU, which is a <clears throat> fertilizer end user. So this is what the farmer will see uh, or the agent uh, or advisor, whoever has access to the system. Uh, so you can click on National Fertilizer Database there. And then when you go through that, uh, and like I said, I, I'm giving quite a brief presentation today. Uh, hopefully I'll come back and give more detail uh, in the future in a couple of months time. But um, there is a video online uh, up on the website that talks through exactly what's involved uh, by screenshots, uh, goes through the system in, in detail. And it is quite simple. It's clicking. It's, it's no more difficult than when you're going onto a website on your phone and you have to tick a box to say, you know, you're happy. Uh, that's exactly the same kind of thing. So it's it's very straightforward. Um, 
The other aspect of it is there will be some data sharing. So there are provisions, um, and this is something that came up in the pre-legislative scrutiny, um, some concerns about this, but other ministers of the government for performance of their functions. So we have to be very specific in what we're sharing and why we're sharing it and who we're sharing it with. Um, and there would be data sharing agreements in place um, in terms of dealing with that data and the security of the data and when that data is uh, deleted from the systems. Um, third parties as well prescribed by the minister to achieve environmental and sustain sustainability targets. Uh, and just to reassure people that there are specific provisions um, to ensure safeguards around data sharing and compliance with all data protection legislation. Uh, so we will be obliged to comply with all that and will. Uh, communications to date, I suppose uh, I didn't put this in, uh, but signposts is, <laughs> is a good one to have as well. And I suppose this is just illustrating um, we presented to the Ground Limestone Association. Uh, there was Chagas training, nutrient use efficiency course. Again, um, that would have been um, Mark Plunkett was the contact for that one. And Chagas training of counter staff. And to be honest, that was a very interesting one because we got quite good feedback um, from the counter staff. So they were telling us what, where potential issues would arise with the implementation of this. Uh, so that was quite a useful one for us, as well as getting the, the message out there. Um, and then the contractors um, conference, the Association of Farm and Forestry Contractors of Ireland, they invited us down. And again, there was a, a, a good discussion um, on possible issues. Uh, the ploughing match, we had a leaflet at that. And then again, um, the Tillage Ed Edge podcast. Um, that was uh, Michael Hennessy, I think, and again, Chagas. So Chagas have been very helpful to us in, in getting our message out there. Uh, we also have a stakeholder uh, consultative group. Um, so that's representative bodies uh, that met four times last year. Uh, again, good discussions and good feedback in that. Uh, and we did tweak the system uh, based on those meetings. And then there was an IT steering group meeting as well, just discussing uh, how to go about uh, connecting with the IT side of things. And just to... I'm nearly finished, I think, now. Uh, further information, um, that's just a website there. And on the website, you'll have an overview of the, the database. The consultative committee meetings that I've mentioned, there's agendas and minutes on there. Um, there's a note, uh, just a, a, an overview, a, a page or two, and also frequently asked questions. So all the questions we've been asked to date at the various different um, presentations uh, and meetings, uh, we've put all those in there with the answer to them as well. Um, Pre-legislative scrutiny report, um, the draft fertilizer product catalog, um, that's not quite finished yet, but it's just a PDF of what it will look like. Uh, and then there's information videos from IT. That's my timer making noise there, sorry. Uh, information videos on the system for end users, agents and merchants. Uh, just to say the videos were put up as uh, for end users and merchants, but obviously agents and advisors who have access to the system will have the same access and will be able to do the same things as the, uh, as the farmer. Okay, thank you very much. That's great, Finbar, thanks very much. And thanks for keeping on time. And uh, look, there's no doubt that this will have fairly far reaching uh, implications for for the sector so uh, i think it's really important to to get out early with those the the information um so there are questions coming through and we we maybe hold those to till after your your uh, ted's presentation so uh, ted Cheers. we'll hand over to you and um we will take you take your slides um We've got a huge, uh, huge crowd this morning. I think we've a, a record breaking crowd this morning, over 600 people joining us online this morning. So uh, obviously there's huge interest in this uh, topic uh, because of its, uh, the implications it has for the sector. So, um, so Ted, we'll, we'll, we'll hand over to you and we'll, we'll take questions after. Right, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about the changes under the Nitrates Action Programme and then looking at the derogation in the longer term as well. But I suppose to begin with, I'm going to set a little bit of the background out. So the nitrates directive, we're going back to the legislation that was introduced in the 1990s, and it set out two objectives, and they were to reduce and prevent water pollution caused by agriculture. The directive sets a limit of a maximum of 170 kilograms of livestock manure nitrogen per hectare, but it does go on to say that a higher limit may be allowed, provided that it's justified, and it won't prejudice achievement of the objectives of the directive. 
So you can go above 170 if you've justified circumstances such as our long grass growing season or high rainfall levels. But that is predicated on ensuring that you are still reducing and preventing water pollution caused by agriculture. So under the directive, each member state must drop a nitrates action program. And our first nitrates action program came into effect in 2006. It gives effect to the nitrates regulations. It's designed to prevent pollution of watercourses from agricultural sources covering both nitrogen and phosphorus. And ultimately, it's designed to protect and improve water quality. So in line with the directive, the nitrates action program is reviewed every four years with the most recent reviews taking place in 2017 and 2021. And the Nitrates Action Programme is given legal effect through the Good Agricultural Practice for Protection of Waters Regulations or what's commonly known as the GAP regs or the Nitrates regs. So to look at the background to the last review, the review that took place in 2021, compared to the previous review in 2017, nationally our chemical fertilizer use was up by in the region of 30 to 40,000 tonnes per annum. And the dairy herd was growing. Um, between 2017 and 2021, there was a 12% increase in dairy cow numbers. And those cows were becoming increasingly concentrated in the south and the southeast of the country. So to look at water quality and how, how things were going in that regard, this is 2020 data. There is more recent data from the EPA, but this is the data that we had when that review was taking place in 21. So if you look at the slide on the left, it covers river nitrate. And you can see that 47% or, or almost half of our rivers had unsatisfactory levels of river nitrate. And the trends weren't good. 38% or two in five were showing an increasing river nitrate trend. On the phosphorus side, 29% or almost a third of our rivers had unsatisfactory levels of phosphorus. And again, in terms of trends, around 24% or, or a quarter were showing an increasing trend. And if we look at the more recent data, that's, that phosphorus trend is the only real change. Um, the number of rivers with an increasing trend for phosphorus has dropped back to 17%. Um, but that is still one in six of our rivers. And if we look at the ecological status of our water in, in the most recent EPA report, almost 50% of our waters have less than good ecological status. So looking at those trends and thinking back to the nitrates directive around the objectives of preventing and reducing pollution, there was a clear need to, to stabilize and then reverse those, those negative trends in terms of water quality. And, and that's an issue for all farmers, because if we reflect on it, the quality of the water in any catchment is representative of the cumulative impacts of all pressures on that catchment. So it could be septic tanks, it could be urban wastewater treatment plants, it, it could be agriculture, but it's all farm, all farms and all sectors of agriculture. To address water quality, it's not an issue of derogation versus non-derogation, dairy versus dry stock, livestock versus tillage. It's an issue for all farmers to play their part in reducing the loss of nutrients to water and, and seeking to reverse those trends. So with those trends in mind, and given the background, we had to implement um, stronger measures for the protection of water quality and I suppose I'm now going to focus on the changes that have become applicable from this year, because within the Nitrates Action Programme, certain existing measures were retained, some new measures were introduced, and other measures were expanded to become applicable to more farmers over time. So to look at the closed period for slurry and chemical fertilizer, the closed period for slurry this year starts on the 1st of October. So that's two weeks earlier than it had been under the previous nitrates action program. And, you know, essentially the best advice to farmers is get your slurry out in appropriate weather and soil conditions in the spring to get the maximum value from it. But ultimately under regulation, 
that slurry should all be spread before the end of September. In terms of chemical fertilizer application, the time when, when fertilizer may be spread in the spring is essentially put back by two weeks. So the closed period for chemical fertilizer this year now ends on the 26th of January in zone A, the 29th of January in zone B, and the 14th of February in zone C. And there are now predefined scientific criteria that will allow an extension of the slurry spreading season up to potentially the 15th of October, or that will allow earlier chemical fertilizer application from those original dates in mid-January onwards. Um, but these criteria only become applicable in exceptional circumstances. And ultimately that will be a ministerial decision for the Minister for Housing in consultation with the Minister for Agriculture. To reduce losses, we're keen to get more efficient use of our slurry and our organic manures. So low emission slurry spreading is becoming compulsory for an expanding cohort of farmers. And from this year, it applies to everyone with a grassland stocking rate of 150 kilograms nitrogen or above. Next year, it's applicable to everyone above 130 and in 2025, applicable for everyone farming at over 100 kilos. And at this stage now, low emission slurry spreading must be used for all pig slurry applications and all applications to arable land, unless that slurry is being incorporated within 24 hours. We also have changes regarding soil water storage and management for dairy farmers. So now this December, we will have a three week close period for soil water. And that expands to the full month of December in, in 2024, with the exception of those farmers who are involved in winter milk, who have a, a winter milk supply contact with their processor, who have until December 25 to have that, that full close period. And the soil water storage requirements increase in line with that. And why? Well, because December is the riskiest period in terms of application of nutrients to land. From this year, we're introducing banding of excretion rates for dairy cows. And this is something the Commission asked us to, to consider and include in our nitrates action program. And the reason for that is because not all cows are equal. The cow's excretion rate will depend on the genetics of the cow and how she is managed. And the science shows us as milk yield increases, the cow's excretion rate will also increase. So each herd will be assigned to one of three bands each year. Some herds will be assigned to the low band of 80 kilograms of nitrogen per head. Most herds, we reckon around two thirds of herds will be in the middle band, which will be assigned to 92 kilograms of nitrogen. And for band three, those high yielding herds, they'll be assigned to 106 kilograms of nitrogen per cow per year. And that is a significant change from the current overall excretion rate of 89 kilograms that was applicable up to 22. So how are we going to calculate this? Well, it'll be based on the herd's average milk yield over either the previous three years or for the preceding year. So for example, for 2023 banding, it's the years 2021, 22, sorry, 2020, 21, and 22, if the farmer wants to opt for the three year average, or it's the year 2022, the most recent year. And that dairy co op data will be combined with animal number data from our AIM database to determine the average milk yield per cow in the herd for each year. Farmers will have two ways to confirm their band to us. Um, for those farmers whose milk data is being transferred to ICBF, and that is the majority of farmers, they will be able to go online on the ICBF website, look at the calculations, look at the banding, and be able to confirm which option they wish to select. For farmers whose co-ops are not maybe transferring data to ICBF, or if the farmer hasn't given cons consent, they have the option of 
using a paper form, but that will be more onerous on the farmer. They'll have to go to their milk purchaser, get the form completed and get milk statements for, for the previous three years. They'll then have to submit that to us. We'll have to combine that with the farm's aim data to come up with the average yield and then advise the farmer of the band. So the preference and the long-term option for all farmers should be to use ICBF. The reason ICBF have developed that portal is because farmers were coming to them last summer and asking them about banding, would they be able to confirm it? Because farmers knew ICBF had all their data. And so ICBF approached us with a view to providing this as a service for farmers. For farmers who choose not to engage in either of those options, they will be defaulted to the high band until they submit information to prove otherwise to us. And the reason for that is that a farmer who chooses not to engage should never be at an advantage over the farmers who do choose to engage and follow the legislation. To look at soil sampling then, um, soil sampling is becoming mandatory for an increasing cohort of farmers. And from this year, all farmers with a grass and stocking rate above 130 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare must take soil samples. And for arable farmers, all sown arable land must be soil sampled. Where soil samples are not taken, the farmer has to assume a phosphorus index of four. And that means there are implications in terms of chemical fertilizer use. In most cases, chemical phosphorus will not be permitted. And there are also implications for farmers who wish to import organic manures. There are increasing requirements around buffer strips. So on tillage land, the regulations introduced last year introduced a six meter buffer strip requirement for the protection of intersecting watercourses. So that is where the field is draining down into the watercourse and there's a late harvested crop being sown. For, so for farmers who are going to plough land for main crop potatoes, maize, sugar beet, fodder beet, they have to leave an uncultivated six meter buffer adjacent to the watercourse in that scenario. There previously was a two meter buffer strip requirement um, for arable crops. And that buffer strip requirement, again, to be left untilled, is expanded to three meters um, from the 1st of January this year to align with the CAP strategic plan regulation. And in line with that regulation, the buffer strip applicable for the application of chemical fertilizer adjacent to surface water is also increased to three meters for all land with effect from the start of this year. There, there are other gap measures as well, but I suppose the most significant change uh, relates to the storage of silage bales. So from this year, in the absence of suitable facilities for the collection and storage of silage effluent, silage bales must not be stored any more than two bales high. And obviously the requirements around the, the setback distance from surface waters or abstraction points continue for, for silage storage as well. In recent weeks, there has been some commentary in the media around a reduction in the maximum chemical nitrogen allowances for grassland, but that reduction was applicable last year, and there is no further reduction in chemical nitrogen allowances for this year. Okay, that 10% reduction was applicable from March of last year. There are also a number of non GAP measures, measures outside the regulations um, that are included in the Nitrates Action Programme. For example, the, the fertilizer sales database that Finbar has talked about already. And there are measures around improving compliance and enforcement. So last year, the Commission required us to increase our inspection rate for derogation farmers from 5% of inspections per annum to 10% of, of, of farmers per annum. So last year, that meant we had to go from inspecting around 350 to inspecting 700 derogation farmers. And that will continue. That is a requirement of the Commission's extension of our, of our derogation. But separate to that, the local authorities are also developing a national agriculture inspection program through the EPA. And that aims to increase the number of local authority inspections on farm standardize those inspections in terms of their approach and their reporting 
and move them to a more consistent and more effective risk basis. And I suppose the other thing then is within DAFM, we are also doing a number of, of rapid field visits now at this time of year, where we're going on farm, doing, doing quick farmyard inspections to check compliance with the regulations. The ASA program or the Agricultural Sustainability Support and Advisory program continues. And outside of the NAP, we have two significant measures. An EIP to improve water quality on farm by providing funding for the first time to assist farmers to develop requirements to go beyond baseline regulatory requirements. So that is a fund of 50 million euro for on-farm investments over the next five years. And that fund is separate to, to the budget for the administration of that EIP. And the budget last year introduced accelerated capital allowances for capital investments in slurry storage infrastructure. And that's applicable from the start of January this year and should be available for the next three years. So that is, you might have seen some commentary in the in the media in recent days around that. Um, the legislation at the moment sets out it's due to apply till the end of June, but that is due to be amended when the EU state aid rules are, are finalised. So that legislation will be amended and will extend that. Looking to the future then, this year we have to conduct an interim review of our nitrates action programme. And the idea of the interim review is to look at the effectiveness of the measures we have in place and to consider whether any new measures are required in light of changes in farm practices or changes in water quality data. So we've an open mind regarding that review, but three things were flagged in the original Nitrates Action Program um, that we have to look at as part of the review. And they are to consider the covering of external slurry stores, to conduct a review of the application of sludge and industrial waste to land, and potentially a further reduction in chemical nitrogen allowances. So then to move on, just to talk about the, the nitrates derogation. And I suppose most of you are probably aware at this stage, Ireland is one of only three and a half EU member states with the derogation. The other member states that currently have a derogation are the Netherlands, Denmark, and the Flanders region within Belgium. At this stage, all other member states have either given up on seeking a derogation or have been refused a derogation by the Commission. And the derogation that the Dutch have at present very clearly sets out a trajectory to transition them out of derogation by the end of 2025 and states that they will not be granted a further derogation. So from our perspective, the next time we go to seek an extension to our derogation, a best case scenario, it's likely to be ourselves, the Danes, and that Flanders region within Belgium that, that will have a derogation. So to look at the current derogation, back in March, we secured an extension of our derogation to cover the period 2022 to 2025. But looking back at our water quality trends, our increasing fertilizer use, our increasing livestock numbers, and the objective of the nitrates directive, that in granting a derogation, the commission had to be assured it would have no negative impacts on water quality. Um, in light of all of that, the Commission imposed additional conditionality on us. And in their implementing decision, one element of that additional conditionality was the requirement for us to undertake a two year water quality review in 2023. And that's effectively comparing water quality data that the EPA have for 2021 with data for 2022. And where that review identifies polluted waters or where there are worsening trends in water quality, the maximum stocking rate on farms in that catchment must reduce from the current 250 kilograms of livestock nitrogen 
back to a maximum of 220 kilograms from 2024 onwards. So we don't yet have 2022 data and the EPA are still, still analyzing that. Um, we would hope to have it for early summer. So at this stage, we don't know what the outcome of the review will be, but there is a risk that significant areas and potentially all of the country could see itself moving to a maximum stocking rate of 220 kilograms nitrogen from 2024 onwards. The commission implementing decision sets out that that review must be concluded by the end of September 2023. And for us going back to the commission and seeking a further extension to our nitrate surrogation in 2025, you know, water quality is going to be critical for us. We can argue, and we will argue, that Ireland is unique. You know, we have a grass-based system very different to our continental European colleagues. However, if we don't see a reversal of those negative trends in water quality, it'll become very difficult for us to secure an extension to our nitrate derogation, in particular, where there are less and less countries in receipt of a derogation. So to conclude, we all need to work together to stabilize and reverse the recent negative trends in water quality. As I said, water quality in a catchment reflects the cumulative impact of all pressures on that catchment. And so water quality is an issue for every farmer and every farming sector within Irish agriculture. So if you're a farmer or if you're involved in dealing with farmers, it's to ask yourself, well, what can you do to try and improve our water quality with a view to securing our industry into the future? Now, that's it. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Ted, um, and, and very clear uh, presentation there. So um, it's great that we'll have that available on the, the Chagask uh, website afterwards for people to, to review. And we are getting a no, huge amount of uh, questions and really excellent questions. So do keep the questions coming um, because um, I, I think it will be useful for, for Ted and for, for Fimar to have those questions that maybe could add, be added to a I frequently asked questions uh, around this whole topic because it is there's a lot of new things here for for people um just just i suppose my my own question it relates to um you know those farmers that are let's say that are, are reliant on an agricultural advisor to to do a lot of their their um, interactions with ag food and so forth um is that how how do those farmers will they interact with that, or is there, is there a role here for um, the co-ops and so on to to assist farmers in, in complying with these regulations? Yeah, I, I would say there's a role for everyone who's working in the sector to to try and improve compliance. You know, there there is a need to improve compliance, and when we were meeting the commission to negotiate the extension to our derogation, they were very clear that we had to improve compliance and improve enforcement. And they insisted on us moving to that 10% inspection rate. Mm -hmm. And they also insisted on other measures. And that's why the EPA are working with the local authorities to, to expand things. But there is also certainly a role for, for co-ops and sustainability bonus schemes to try and improve the sustainability of Irish agriculture. And, and do we have a figure on the number of farmers that are uh, above 130 kilograms of nitrogen uh, that will be required to, to take soil samples? I, I don't have that figure to hand, but I mean, a lot of a lot of our dry stock farmers are farming at less than 130 kilograms. You know, a lot of them are farming at less than 100 kilograms. Um, we have around about, in recent years, around about 12,000 farmers farming at over 170. Um, mm -hmm. And they've already been required to take soil samples anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's it's this cohort that are above 130 and, and are arable farmers as well, who are now obliged to take soil samples. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Ted. Okay, in the interest of time, I think we'll get straight straight to the questions. Um, Vinbar and, and Ted, in the interest of trying to maybe get through as many as, as we can, if we could try and keep the responses as concise as possible. Uh, Pat, I, I can see you're yeah, yeah, there's a lot of a few of them together. Yeah, a, a lot of quick questions. Uh, and, and for Finbar first, uh, can a farmer sell, oh, sorry, can farmers sell to each other uh, fertilizer? 
Yes, they can. There's a farm to farm movement and you there's a further registration for that, which again is just a simple tick box once you're in ag food okay. to allow to allow you to be able to import um, and also transfer farm to farm. There's a couple of questions then around the ability of the co-ops to use the, the, the data for sustainability purposes. And I suppose a question around what exactly will a co-op be able to see in relation to a farmer's data? OK, I suppose an example, the only one I can think of off the top of my head now is um, where uh, a co-op may reward farmers for using uh, inhibited uh, urea products. So I suppose what would be known as protected urea. So in that case, all we'd probably need to share is the percentage protected urea used in the overall sense. And then there'd be a, some sort of bonus for the for the supplier um, in that. Uh, that's the only one I can think of right now. But just to say that any data that's being shared, that will go through the, the proper channels and there will be checks and balances on that. It will comply with all data protection legislation. Uh, so there there won't be an issue from that uh, standpoint. And I suppose what we share is as little as possible to achieve the goal. Um, that's it. And am I right in assuming that a co-op uh, will only see the data that they supplied uh, uh, for that farmer? They won't if if I'm dealing with two merchants, they won't see each other's data. No, the merchants will download their own data, but I suppose for the overall, like the example I gave, all, all the information would be together, but it would just be giving a percentage. So there'd be no information of commercial sensitivity in that. Uh, what about farmers in border counties whose local merchants uh, may be across the border? Yeah, um, we have spoken with, with Northern Ireland and they're not in a position. They, they like the idea of what we're doing and they probably will follow suit, but they can't do it uh, as quickly as we can. Uh, so the, the facility is there in the system for the farmer to input that information uh, themselves onto the system if they're importing directly onto farm. If merchants are importing, then that's captured in the sales. But there is also imports uh, will be captured on the system, uh, whether it's merchants or the, you know, the Yaras and the Goulings of this world as well. Uh, they'll be all captured. Can I just ask in relation to farmers knowing their limit and how 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 do they know if they're sailing close to the wind or will there be any notifications around that Finbar? Um, I, there won't be because I suppose this is sales. So I suppose how the information we'll have is we'll have an opening stock from a, a farmer, the sales to that farmer and a closing stock. So once we have all that data, we can give the annual figure, if you like, of what was used on that particular farm. Uh, so I suppose there is no interim data. And I suppose realistically, uh, data will come from uh, industry, say the January data, all their sales, they'll reconcile that in their own books, they'll do their own checks and balances, and then in February they'll upload it onto our system, so it'll be a few weeks behind, so I suppose the onus is still on the farmer uh, to know where they're at with their limits, uh, and there is no obligation on retailers, co-ops or merchants to have any, uh, any idea of any of that, they're just selling it, and, and the responsibility is with the farmer to ensure they stay within limits. So the farmers still will have to, they'll have to calculate what their, their limits are for the year themselves and uh, be sure that that's their, their stocks align with that or or what they've spread. Yeah, exactly. And I suppose a, a couple of questions uh, there in relation to what farmers have to do immediately. And I'm assuming there's nothing they have to do at the moment, but th that does mean that when it comes to next year producing records, there won't necessarily be a full record on the system for 2023. Yeah, unfortunately, that is the case. And I suppose there's there, there's there's pros and cons to that. We just have to accept that that is the, the, the case now, uh, Pat, as you rightly say. And I suppose what we would say is that uh, it gives us time to get everyone into the system, get the kinks ironed out, um, and then we'd be good to go uh, for the next uh, fertilizer year. Uh, will lime sales be recorded? Yes, they will. Uh, and I suppose just to follow on from the other, have you any idea uh, as to the likely date for, for startup? I don't. I've I've spoken to my expert in, in, in the legal sphere and uh, we'll just have to wait. And as soon as we have information, we will uh, communicate that out through the stakeholder groups uh, and any other avenue we can find, to be honest. Uh, we, we will communicate that, but we don't have a definite date as yet. But it is, we've done what we can do. It's it's going through the Oireachtas. It's in the system. So as soon as we know, uh, we'll get that information out. Okay. Uh, what level of access will advisors have on behalf of their farmers to the database? Yeah, advisors, once the farmer gives them that access, they will have the same access as, as the farmer. 
so they can go into the system. Uh, so if your advisor is doing this for you, he'll be able to go in and do everything that needs to be done. Now, the thing to remember is once you're registered, uh, unless you're importing from outside the state or you're um, transferring farm to farm, your only interaction really is to is to record your, the stock on farm on a particular date. As I say, so, sometime in autumn, it hasn't been fully uh, decided yet. Um, and that's that will be the only interaction for, for the vast majority of farmers. Uh, just uh, in terms of the, the fertilizer register uh, and the level of inspection on, on fertilizers, given that you will have a very strong level of information, will that lead to a reduction in the amount of, of uh, inspections on that particular topic? Yeah, I've 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 asked the Integrated Controls Division about this, and and they're kind of obliged to have a one percent um, checking on this. Uh, so it's um, what is it called, conditionality inspections. But I suppose this this area is easily checked if someone's on farm checking something else. Uh, so I'm sure Ted would be delighted to be checking additional things when he's out there anyway. Yeah, and I suppose just, just to come in on that, like when the National Fertilizer Sales Database is up and running and is in a position to provide reliable data for the likes of the derogation farmers, they will no longer have to submit fertilizer records to ourselves because we, we'd have all that information. So that'll, that'll make things a lot easier for the Chagas or the, or the private agricultural advisors and for the farmers as well. Okay, thank you for that, Finbar. I think that's most of your inquisition. <laughs> we'll move over to Ted for his now. Okay, just just to say before I finish, um, the Ted mentioned the countries with derogation, and I was talking to my Danish colleagues, and they have pretty much the same system as what we're trying to set up um, in place at the moment. Uh, they're trying to tweak it, but it is essentially what we're trying to do, uh, the same sort of system. Okay, first question is just for clarity. The stocking rate limits for soil sampling, is this a grassland stocking rate or a whole farm stocking rate? It's the grassland stocking rate and it's the stocking rate in the previous year. So the farmer can look at their, their 2022 stocking rate on, on grassland and then decide whether they need to do soil sampling. I suppose a, a question there, the regulation changes that have come into place in the uh, last couple of years and, and the, the ones that are coming into place now, in your view, will, will su su sufficient time be given to allow those to have an impact before further decisions are made or are we in a, a bit of a bind in, in relation to that? That's probably the biggest challenge we have. Because I would say we now have a robust set of measures that, that you know, if farmers comply with them, um, we are going to see improvements in water quality. But the challenge is the lag time between when we implement a measure and when we see the, the full effect. And, and you know this, Pat, I mean, that'll, that'll vary from, from one to 10 years, maybe even longer. And you know, that is a challenge for us in, in negotiating with the Commission because they say they don't have time. So, so that is that is a very topical issue. In relation, in relation to the soil sampling and, and when that has to be completed by, uh, what's the schedule there, Ted? Well, la the soil sample will be valid for four years, but if there is a farmer who now has land that, that is obliged to, to be subject to soil sampling, they have to assume a phosphorus index of four in the absence of that soil sample result. Okay. So it's it's for the farmer to decide when, when they want to sample, but if they want to import slurry or they want to buy chemical fertilizer for that land, they, they need to be conscious they, they may not have a sample for it. And, and do farmers have to be a member of Herd Plus uh, to access the milk yield data or tick the box to give the department access to the data? No, all farmers will be able to access the ICBF website if they wish. And then the, the question is, does ICBF have their data? But the majority of the co-ops transfer data. You know, there, there will be some farmers that have advised their co-op they don't have permission to transfer data to ICBF. So they will have to either give the co-op the consent or else they will, they will have to do a paper return to ourselves. And will farmers over the 130 kilograms nitrogen per hectare, will they be contacted by the department uh, about the requirement to soil sample? How, how will that work? Yeah, I suppose a, a challenge for us is that we look at all livestock on the holding in terms of determining the grassland stocking rate. So 
we have cattle only data at the moment. So a farmer can log into ag food and they can see their, their nitrates levels in terms of cattle only. But then we have to combine that with the likes of sheep. So where there's a mixed enterprise, we have to get sheep census data. So it'll, it'll be later in the year that we'll be able to say exactly who was over 130. That becomes an issue obviously for us in terms of our compliance. But we, we intend to send an SMS message to all farmers over something in the region, say 120, uh, to advise them that if they consider themselves to be over 130 for last year, you know, they should take soil samples. Okay, that makes sense. In terms of uh, cow banding, will the option uh, for preceding year always be available? Yes, and like it's, it's very important. The band applies for one year and then it, it, it is reviewed based on the more recent data. Uh, what organic end value will be allocated to cull cows uh, being finished in non-dairy, uh, in, in a beef finishing herd? If, it, if, it's a, if it's an animal in a beef finishing herd, it's at 65 kilograms, a bovine animal over two years. Um, if it's retained in the dairy herd, it continues to be a dairy cow because we want to keep things as simple as possible for farmers. Okay, there's a, always a, a little bit of contention about the marked lines in relation to the uh, surface waters for the three meter. Uh, is there an exact definition of that? Yeah, so if the water course is marked on a one to 5,000 ordnance survey map or, or a higher scale ordnance survey map, um, higher definition map, then it counts as, as a water where you have to have those, those buffer strips. Uh, as a question there in relation to inspections for soil water uh, storage in, in, in December, uh, what extra inspections are you uh, proposing uh, in, uh, to cover that period? And what other measures, I'll, I'll lump two together, what other measures or increased measures are there around surveillance of slurry spreading in that, in that closed period? Well, I suppose in, in terms of our inspections, and, and the local authorities inspections, like they go on on an annual basis. So, you know, we will be, we will be out on farms in, in December as will the local authorities. And um, we are doing a, an increased cohort of, of these farmyard inspections now through our colleagues in integrated controls um, in the period between January and March of this year. And um, so we, we just have to see how, how things develop in terms of that space. I, I can safely say we're not going to get through all of the questions here this morning yeah. because of the, the the level of interest in today's session. So uh, we we will continue we'll continue and get through as many of them possible. Just a, a question I have in relation to the grants available for the the low emission slurry spreading. Uh, do they will they continue to be available after twenty twenty five or or how how will that work? Should farmers who are going to be um, uh, required to use uh, LESS, are, will, will the grant be available to them, or if uh, and if not, should they get going on that as soon as possible? Yeah, uh, essentially, once something becomes mandatory under regulation, um, you're constrained in terms of the grant aid you can provide. The legislation does allow for something to be grant aided um, for a period of up to 24 months after it has become mandatory. So, in the longer term low emission slurry spreading uh, capital investment grants will only be available to those farmers who are stocked at less than 100 kilograms of organic nitrogen. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ted. A question, when will farmers know their, their banding status if they give permission to use the data? Yeah, I suppose at this stage, the, the co-ops are, are finalizing processing of the, of the milk data for December. And we expect in early February that that ICBF should have that data and be in a position to share it with farmers. Um, we will also be writing to farmers very shortly to communicate on banding just how exactly that, that process will work and the options available to farmers. Okay, in terms of the size of buffer strips uh, for fodder crops such as kale for livestock grazing over the winter, what's the requirement there? Now, you have me there, Pat, I'll admit. I'm not out on the ground inspecting those crops. I know there are buffer strip requirements and there are lieback requirements as well. You know, and again, it goes back to, in particular, avoiding the, the transfer of sediment and, you know, runoff of soil particles and in particular phosphorus to water. 
We're quite comment in here. I, I think we'll take it as a comment. It says it would be helpful if the processors in their sustainability payments incentivized low and reduced nitrogen uh, use rather than payment for purchasing protected urea. It penalizes farmers who are reducing their end usage and gives the wrong signal to farmers. Uh, this is in the context of the everyone has a role to play comment, I think, that you made earlier, Ted. So I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, well, it, it, it's a very valid comment. And like, if we look at the the outcome of the dairy vision and and the beef and lamb uh, works under groups work under food vision, you know, they have set out ambitious targets for, for fertilizer reduction. And, you know, ultimately, if we want to get to a more sustainable system, both economically and environmentally, we do have to look at reducing our fertilizer use. It's not just a question of changing from one form to another. Yeah, sorry, can I just say, I just pull, pull that example off the top of my head. It is, it is a possibility. There's obviously also overall reduction in, in nitrogen uh, would, be, would be in there as well. And just to say that there will be, you know, there's a lot of data, useful data that would be collected by the National Fertilizer Database that will reduce, as, as Ted has said, it will reduce the administrative burden long term uh, on farmers. There's a, a couple of questions about the handling of mixed uh, uh, breeds or, or dual purpose breeds in uh, dairy herds how are they going to be identified as as dairy yeah so i suppose farmers who are registered with icbf may be doing milk recording they'll they'll already have have milk recording data for those cows from our perspective if if it's a cow in a in a dairy herd we're proposing that that all cows count, but there will be some herds where there's maybe mixed enterprises. For example, there's there's a small number of suckler cows um, on a dairy farm, and I suppose it's cases like that we will have to probably address on a case by case basis. But for, for the majority of dairy farmers, they're only running dairy cows. Okay, the commission Im implementing decision for the derogation also looks at waters that are eutrophic or at risk of becoming eutrophic. Is this not a bigger concern than the trends between 2021 and 2022? Yeah, I suppose there, there are four elements um, to that two-year water quality review. The, the first two relate to nitrates and nitrates trends, um, and the other one relates to eutrophic or could become eutrophic with a stable or worsening trend. The, the Commission implementing decision requires us to look at 21 versus 22, and it's when you, you put those four tests together, you, you have the outcome. If a catchment fails any one of those four tests, that catchment has to move to, to the maximum of 220. So it's nitrogen and, and eutrophic status are, are the issues there. Uh, a farmer that came in under 120 kilograms uh, grass and stocking rate uh, for organic N in 2022, but wants to import slurry in 2023, do they need the soil sample? No, because they were under 120 for last year. The requirement applies to, to people who are above 130 for last year. And assume, uh, presumably the import of slurry doesn't affect, uh, doesn't affect their grassland stocking rate. That would be their whole farm stocking rate, if I'm not wrong on that. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, we're, we're gonna have to probably make this one the last one, Pat. Okay. Uh, can a farmer choose previous year uh, in 2023 and switch to three-year average in the in the next year? Yeah, in terms of banding, each year is a new start. So the data rolls on next January, February, the farmer will confirm their band for 2024. Okay, uh, there's still a lot of, of, of questions. I suppose there will be a, a number of, of uh, opportunities again to to get questions to you. Uh, I think, Mark, what we will try and do is uh, take a look at the, the questions that are left and maybe, Ted, if we if we could uh, uh, maybe just put a few of those questions to you and send them out to, to uh, viewers, if, if that's okay with you. Yeah, certainly. We are developing an FAQ around banding. So we're keen to hear any anyone's questions to be the advisors, feed them in through through your Chagas Central contact point with DAFM. Um, ACA members can feed them in as well, private advisors, nitrates at agriculture.gov.ie. 
And the letter that we're going to send to dairy farmers will include that FAQ. So we want to make it as comprehensive as possible. I suppose just one one clarification, uh, uh, Finbar, there was a question on a specific foliar and liquid fertilizers, but but in essence, I think, am I right in saying that any uh, uh, product that is used to feed a crop, uh, be it uh, macro or mic micronutrient, is coming under the, the gambit of the, the, fer the, the fertilizer database? Yeah, those those foliar stuff. Yeah, they come under it as well. So I suppose the domestic products are the only ones that don't come under it. Um, and I suppose we're primarily concerned with the with the chemical fertilizers and the big the big use. Uh, but we have been asked these questions before, and yes, they they will be uh, in the system as well. Liquid fertilizers, foliar applications, all of those. Okay, I'm afraid we're we're completely out of time here. We'll run over a little bit, but given the the importance of this topic, I think it, it was well worthwhile. Um, Ted and Finbar, thank you so much for for, for really excellent and cl uh, clear presentations today. Pat, thanks for helping with the questions. Uh, and I want to say special thanks to Yvonne Mahers in the background, helping us with the technical side, and to Andy Boland, our uh, series producer. Next week, we'll be joined by Dr. Edward Straw from the School of Agriculture and Food Science in University College Dublin. And he'll be talking about the impacts of pesticides on the environment and what the science says. So until next week, Week. thanks for joining us uh, we certainly had a record crowd this morning um, huge interest in this topic so no doubt we'll be touching on this again uh, throughout the course of the year given the, given its uh, significance on the industry uh, once again Ted and Finbar thanks for joining us and uh, we hope you have a lovely weekend you've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk signpost series the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagisk.ie. And you can also rate, review and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson and thanks for listening.